you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something solid, six feet under. Dead things coming back to life again. It's about to be another resurrection oh, I see signs and I see wonders I see birds of every color Death is coming back in life again I believe there's about to be another resurrection Come alive, wake up sleeper, He is risen, we are risen with Him. Hallelujah, He is given, see the great of God. I believe there's about to be another resurrection There's a God who's real I don't need the lights to fool me Cause I have seen the God who heals No when I ask I'll receive it Cause you're not a God who is whole I hear you 
said just believe me I need a holy God Holy God in my soul I need a love that goes down
Come on, you glad you came to church? Come on, let's, let's give him a home. This is his home here in our chest. day to be in the house of God today. I know God uh, has a word for you this morning. I want to do something quickly because I got uh, heck in the other service because I took up too much of his time. Um, would you welcome my friend to the stage, Pastor Nate Pacini from Substance Church. Substance Church is kind of like, it's kind of like the mother hen and uh, venue church is the, the duckling hens. Whatever, you get it, you get it. Uh, pastor Nate's uh, pastors my, uh, are my pastors as well, Pastor Peter and Carolyn Haas, and Nate is the executive of Substance Church. He has a word from God for you. We're like, we're like friends and stuff, probably too close uh, friends. We got to hang out with each other for a couple of days after the ARC conference. Were you at the ARC conference? Some of you were there. And so uh, that was so great to see what God is doing, not just here in our city, but in our nation. And that was such a powerful time. And uh, part of what you give actually goes to plant churches in our nation. And these, uh, these guys are the uh, ones in, in ARC and that organization who kind of took us under their wing and love us and help us and spend time with us. And so come on, Pastor Nate, give us the word of God. And just to be clear, just to be clear, restart his clock. You happy? Thank you. Thank you for restarting my clock. No, I'm joking. Hey, I, I just want to take a moment honor your pastors, Pastor Corey and Aaron. I love you all. You're, you're faithful. You're generous. You're consistent. You're planted. You're committed. You're big dreamers. God is actually raising up legacy through your kids because of your faithfulness, because of the healing process, because of what you've committed to. Uh, the Lord has not wasted anything in your life. He has this really awesome ability to turn it back for his good and for his glory and, uh, and multiply your impact in your kids and your legacy. Uh, the idea of legacy, the idea of what you do matters, the idea of, uh, of your surrender, your submission to the Lord, it, it does matter. And i uh, just humbled every time I'm around your daughters because they... They love the house of God. They're committed to the house of God. They work so hard in the house of God, but with not, not begrudgingly, but with joy and with excitement and with mission and purpose. Some of y'all need to learn from them. Get in mission. Come on. Hey, I just uh, real quick before I start. <clears throat> before I start, I'm joking. <laughs> had a, a just a word from the Lord that I, I thought I would hold for this service and it was for you all and it was the expansion of this house that uh, properties and facilities are not an issue for God they're an issue for man 
because uh, we think so simple and we think in the method of man, but God in his kingdom sovereignty has uh, rule and reign over all territories. It's his. Just, the Lord just kept giving me an image of this wall leaving. Not that you can even physically do that or legally do that, uh, but, or structurally do that. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of physics at play here, but the, the idea of this wall leaving to make room in a place in this city for people that are hurting and lost and need a house that so they can meet maybe their uh, future hope of friends and people who care for them, love for them. And it, it's, not, it's not to glorify us to have more space and more room, but it's, it, it's the burden and the mission of the Great Commission. And so I just want to prophesy into this house the need for expansion is coming. And this summer is the summer of preparation uh, for reaching more people for Jesus. And if you have any bit of Christ in you, you would, the Holy Spirit was compelling you to see lost people found and found people free and free people on mission and people that are on mission get in the city and make a difference. Do you, do you believe that Airdrie could be a Jesus city? Do you believe that your family and your coworkers and your your friends could actually serve the Lord and love them and experience the supernatural transforming power of Christ Jesus. If you don't, I want you to. And if you do, I want you to want it more. Amen. I'm, I'm here on behalf of my pastors, Pastor, there, there's the little nugget. I'm here on behalf of my pastors, Pastor Peter and Carolyn Haas. It's always an honor to serve on behalf of my pastors. I'm not here, uh, despite them or to get away from them. I'm here on behalf of them. I, I carry the DNA in the heart of our house and just want to impart. Uh, we, have, we have kindred spirits as, as churches and I'm in Minnesota and you're in Alberta and uh, we, but, but we're family of Christ together and uh, God wants to use us uh, in the end times, really. Just so you know, we're in, we're in the latter days. We're in the, la the last days. You know, ever since Jesus ascended to heaven, we've been in the last days. And uh, we've been given the, the commissioning of receiving the Holy Spirit to receive power to do the work he's called us to do. And so I actually believe, re regardless of what I say in my wise and persuasive words, there's something way more wise and persuasive, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit that wants to impart life into this room. So are you hungry and ready for that? Holy Spirit, we just ask you to have your way today. And if there's any method of man that would try to sneak in, would you just remove that? And I just pray for your Holy Spirit to have divine authority in this room to speak, to impart direction, to compel hearts, to convict mindsets, and draw us unto you. In Jesus' holy and powerful and authoritative name I pray. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's give it up for all that God is going to do is going to do i i just i just so believe your best days are ahead of you i so believe that this, this can be your best year i so believe uh uh the encouragement and the affirmation of the lord and man you, as i mentioned earlier very uh, affirming pastors very encouraging pastors in this house they're worth honoring uh honors more for what it does in my heart when I honor someone, but it's so much easier when someone's honorable. Um, you know what I'm saying? And so your pastors are just always so, such encouragers to me. Pastor Corey will reach out and encourage me in a moment uh, of my week more than he even knows to, to just stay faithful, to stay consistent, continue to pursue God. And my pastors are also some of the biggest encouragers I've ever met. Like, they really are. I'm like, man, and it's, it's real. It's authentic. Anybody attracted to authentic encouragement? I'm like that guy, I'm like, yeah, you're lying to me right now, but uh, the real authentic encouragement is such a, a, a building up, and, and my, my pastor and, and Carolyn, they co-lead the church, and Pastor Carolyn's super affirming, uh, she'll encourage everybody, and I'm like, I don't even know if I believe that about them, but that's great. Uh, There's a lady in our church, and uh, she had had three babies over about five years, and you know, kind of went through all the transitions that happen with babies. I act as if I know what happens. I, I think there's some physical changes when you have a child. And uh, struggled to, 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 to lose the weight she had gained in, in, through the pregnancies. And uh, finally had got a plan in place, lost a, 
a lot of the baby way. And uh, so Pastor Carolyn saw a post she made on Facebook. Anybody have Facebook in the room? It's this old social media platform we all used to use, and now we use it as an electronic garage sale or something like that. Uh, but it was this this social media platform, and so this lady posted a picture after she lost all her baby weight, and Pastor Carolyn went on uh, the, the post and commented and said, girl, you look stinking hot after that baby. Uh, unfortunately, Pastor Peter's face popped up next to the comment because she was logged into his account. So all of a sudden, it looked like Pastor Peter was saying, girl, you look stinking hot after that baby. Now, all of us want an affirming pastor, but there's a line there. And uh, unfortunately, though, it was one of those moments that Facebook had up updated their security settings and changed how you delete posts. And so Pastor Carolyn, for the life of her, could not figure out how to delete this comment. And so she called Pastor Peter and I at the church and was like, hey, I posted this. And Pastor Peter's like, what did you do? What is happening? And he, his mind is not processing what's happening here. Unfortunately, very quickly, his reputation was going from Pastor Peter to Predatory Pete. It's like, <laughs> this is not good. we got to figure out how to delete this comment. After, a, uh, after being thrust into the tech support role of a lifetime, we figured out how to delete the comment. We slayed Predatory Pete. We restored my pastor's reputation. And every Sunday, when Pastor Peter sees that lady at church, he's very formal to her and asks about her husband. And so, <laughs> have you ever felt like everything in your life is just one huge disaster? Uh, some of you are like, that's my life every single day. Uh, maybe for you in this room, it's, you feel a delay in your purpose. Maybe for you, you're waiting for a spouse and you feel like it's never going to come. Maybe for you, it's secret shame issues in your life that you've never been able to deal with and you keep being thrust into this cycle of delay and confusion, discouragement. Maybe for you, you just feel like nothing in your life seems to work out. Well, I, I just feel like I was sent here uh, as a friend to this house to encourage you today. I, I believe that today, God is going to do something supernatural in this room. Yeah. I believe that he has supernatural clarity and insight and provision for our lives. I actually don't think it's by accident that you're sitting here or listening to this message. I think it's on purpose. I, I think he knows what he's doing. I actually do believe that. I, I believe that today that God just may be bringing fresh insight and miracles for your life and bringing it your way. Amen? Amen. I mean, a couple times that I've been here, I've preached about uh, this story. I just love the story of a king named Nebuchadnezzar, because I really think it speaks to the character and integrity issues that we wrestle with as humans. And quickly want to summarize the story. It's kind of a dramatic backdrop to another Bible text we're going to be visiting today and another king that we're going to study. So during this, uh, during this story, it took place in the, the book of Daniel. Uh, it, it was a story about a king named Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most powerful kings on earth. God actually came to the king and warned him through the prophet Daniel if he, if he actually didn't change his ways that he would actually go crazy for seven years. How crazy is that? And he, it actually, God told him, hey, if you do not change your ways, you're going to go crazy and you're going to lose everything you have. And check this out. God gave him 12 months to obey. 12 months to respond, 12 months to get his life in order, 12 months. See, you see, we serve a God who is patient and slow to anger, but he is righteous and he is just. And, and yet this king still did not change his life. So exactly as Daniel prophesied in scripture, the king lost his mind for seven years. Pastor Corey's taking my picture, so I just want to pose. <laughs> so for seven years. And let me tell you something in, in this moment. I, I actually learned as I reflected on scripture that God actually still does stuff like this. It's as if we cancel out the Old Testament God for some, some flowery, just Jesus wants to be our friend all the time, which is true, but he cares about righteousness, purity, justice, and holiness. He does. He does. You see... God is holy, and he has to distance himself from things that are unholy, and he gives us the opportunity. We see in scripture, he gave this king 12 stinking months 
to get his act together, yet he didn't do it. And so you may be here today wondering, do the next 12 months of your life really matter? The answer is heck yeah, it matters. What you choose in the next 12 months could really affect the next seven years of your life. What if I told you the next seven years of your life will either thrive or die based off the next 52 weeks? How would you think about your marriage? How would you think about your uh, parenting? I, what if I told you the next seven years of your finances will actually be great or in deficit based on how you behave for the next year? Well, I, actually, here's what's cool. I, the good news is this. If we can simply obey the simple nudges of the Holy Spirit, God has so much for us. The next seven years could actually be pretty stinking awesome. I, I truly believe of that. And, but all of this is merely, as I'm sharing today, a setup for the crazy story that we're going to read today in Daniel chapter 5. You see, Nebuchadnezzar eventually did repent. It took him seven years to repent, by the way. But eventually did repent year after year, not repenting, not acknowledging God. He finally did. And get this, God restored him back to king and restored everything he lost. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar ended up having a grandson named King Belshazzar, who we're going to actually visit today, who actually underwent a very similar test. The city of Babylon was on the verge of war with Persia, so Belshazzar wanted to boost the morale of the people around him. He wanted to leverage his influence to actually in, uh, impress the people that were around him to say, don't worry about the war that's pending. So we're going to pick up here in Scripture in Daniel 5-1, and we're brilliant with our technology, so we're going to have this scripture on the screen behind you. I will not condemn you to take out your Bibles. We, we paid a lot of money for this wall. Just read it with me, people. So here we go. King, King, we see in Daniel 5-1, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for thousands of his nobles, and they drank wine with them. While Be Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his ancestor, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wife, wives and his concubines, hear me say wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Now this may seem like a silly little detail to us, but let's actually lean into this. You, you need to understand these were sacred treasures. These were goblets that were exclusively devoted to God, only to be used by priests and only for worship. And when you gave a cup or a chalice to the temple, admit you, exi you exist to serve God's thirst, to meet God's needs. We're talking Yahweh God in this moment. So when you take a sacred cup back from God, it basically is like saying, God, I'm actually more important than you, is what it says here. You, you should serve me now, God. It's worship unto me, my success, my promotion, my kingdom. And the symbolism in this moment was actually not lost on the king. He knew all the stories about his grandfather and all his grandfather had went through, even the seven years where he lost his mind. Yet he wanted to look powerful to his friends. To his nobles. So check it out. Verse 3. So they brought the golden goblets. They had, they had been taken from the temple of the God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. False idols. Suddenly, in this moment, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Near the lampstand in the royal palace, the king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and it was so frightened that his legs became weak and started knocking. This is in the Bible, people. You all think the Bible's boring? Could you imagine a, a hand coming and beginning to just write words on this wall? All of you would leave me here. I wouldn't see it happening behind me. You would all start running. I would think I did something wrong. That would kind of freak me out if I saw a hand on the wall writing. Then suddenly the, the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. Verse 9. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified. His, grace, his face became even more pale. His nobles were baffled. Verse 10. The, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and the nobles, came into the banquet saying, May the king live forever. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale, she said. 
There, in verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time your father was found to have insight and intelligence, in, in, the, in the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence wi and wisdom of the gods. Your grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief over the magicians, the enchanters, the astrologers, the diviners. Let's skip to verse 13. So Daniel was, has, was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father uh, had exiled from the, had brought out of the, king, the kingdom of Judah? Is what it says. The father the king brought out from Judah. So he's taken from the very place the sacred cups came from. So Belshazzar in this moment was aware that this guy Daniel had some insight on what was actually happening. What's interesting about Daniel's life, he was a holy man. Daniel was known for being a man of prayer and fasting. He was known of being a man who would not give up his conviction, his conscience before God, yet existed in a place of influence in the kingdom. I'm here to tell you today that you can exist in places of influence in Babylon and still be kingdom minded. Did you hear me today? Come on, we can be in this world and not of it. We can have authority over territories, over positions of, in the marketplace, in the work, in the schools, in the places that we are. In this moment, the question, where's Daniel from, from was so significant. So the king knew it was not a coincidence that Daniel came from Judah, the cups came from Judah, and he knew he was actually abusing the sacred cups. Daniel finally speaks here. We skip all the way down to verse 18 because the king wouldn't shut up and stop talking. So we're going to go to where Daniel speaks. Verse 18, he says, Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and the greatness and glory and splendor because of his high position. God gave him, by the way. He did not earn it. He did not just give it by man. God gave it to him. All the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Skip down to verse 20. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of all his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew from heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Did you hear that? But Belshazzar, his grandson, have not humbled yourself, though you know all of this. He was aware of what happened to his grandfather. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand to write this inscription. This is in the inscription was written this way, and it says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Here's what those words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and have, found, have been found wanting. Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 29, then Belshazzar's, uh, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler of the kingdom. He just told the dude some really bad news, and he still got a promotion. And that's the kind of God we serve, amen? That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. The dude got killed, okay? And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at age 62. So the Persians and Medes attacked that very night. And not too long off after that, the Persians actually released the captive Jews. God knew what he was doing here. And that's where we get the expression, as you've heard over the years, the writings on the wall. There you go. Use that in trivia at your next small group. Uh, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? But here's a couple things I want to pull out of this text with our time today. First off... If you want to avoid demotion of a lifetime, listen up, because Daniel gives us some insight here I think is super important to apply to our life. 
We see in Daniel 5, 21 and 22, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men and, and gives them to whoever he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew that. It wasn't that he was ignorant of the consequences of his father-in-law, his, his grandfather. He knew that. And so well, let's look at this. What is a kingdom? Well, actually, I, I think a good way to describe a kingdom, it's a domain of blessing. It could be for you. It could be your family. It could be your business. It could be church ministry. It doesn't have to be an actual kingdom with like a castle in the middle and a, a moat and alligators around it, okay? It could, it, could, it could literally be your area of responsibility. For example... Your income is a part of the kingdom. Right. Your kids, your department at work, your responsibilities here at the church. And Daniel said, God's sovereign over these things and gives them to whoever he wishes. But why would God take away a kingdom from us? Is it because he's a mean, evil God who's wanting to punish his people? No, the, the, the truth is it's the exact opposite. Yeah. God loves us too much. Yeah. And listen, God longs to bless us. But here's the deal. If we don't have the character worthy of that blessing, then it's like this. We're drinking from sacred cups. And then the very blessing of God could actually destroy our lives. Do you believe that, church? So I want, I want to encourage you. We see in verse 22, how do we avoid the consequences that the Lord may have for our circumstances? Well, we see in verse 22, but you... Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself. It's humility. It's confession of sins. It's accountability. I, I've preached here a lot. I feel, I've beat that one down. Like, we need to get in a small group, y'all. It's, 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 therefore, confess your sins with other people where you may be healed. It's exposing the dark corners of your heart. It's dealing with issues that you've not released to God. If there's an area of your life that you've held on, come on, I'm preaching good, you've held on control to, and you haven't let go, you keep it to yourself, you think that just your knowledge of it and your repentance moment is somehow going to resolve it, then honestly, you have not learned the principle of humility. It's more than that, though. It's asking God this question. What is God's definition of success for your life right now? Have you asked God this question? For example, when I ask people, are you successful? Most people talk about their money and their careers. Things like, I have above average income, or I'm, I have above average respect among society. People see me as important. But it's important that we think about other areas of our life, and I feel like I'm here to encourage you. What about your marital success? What about your parenting success? What about your physical health success, your spiritual intimacy, etc.? You get what I'm saying? There's more areas than just your money and your promotion. And here's why this is important. Because one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make is we falsely think that success in one area is going to somehow compensate for failures in others. Did you hear me, church? I meet people all the time that have great jobs, great income, professional success, and they somehow think that they're going to compensate for their horrible marriage and the fact their kids hate them. Or put it another way, a lot of people think obedience in one area is going to compensate for disobedience in another. Have you heard it like that? And there's a, mirror, a million spiritual comparisons we can make here. Let me hit a few. It's okay to skip church as long as I read my Bible. It's okay to not get on a ministry team or join a small group because I know how to ask God to forgive me and I repent all the time but never change my behavior. You know, repentance without a behavioral change is not ever turning around from that thing. It's actually pleasing yourself, turning yourself into God and making yourself feel good for a moment. It's an emotional shift, but it's not a transformational shift. Or it's okay to be financially stingy, you no know, tithes and offerings to, you know, the kingdom principle of giving tithes and offerings because I volunteer all the time. I'm somehow going to substitute my time as a generous offering. And the Lord is saying, I actually want your first and your best. Yeah. You can visit Cain and Abel on that one. The first murder took place because of stinginess. It's okay to get wasted on Friday because I lift my hands on Sunday. Not realizing that all of these things are going to affect our future. They're going to affect our ability to parent well and leave a legacy. Yeah. Obedience, listen church, is not for God's benefit. 
It's for hours. And it's like this. It's like you got a, 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 the legs of a stool, right? God wants us to have the character to withstand the weight of his blessings because he wants to pour out his blessings. But when we're missing certain character traits in our life and disciplines in our life, it's like sitting on a stool that's missing a leg. There's gonna, that one area of your life, at some point, it's going to cause your whole life to fall. But it all begs the question, why? Why do we get our priorities so messed up? Well, as I think about that, uh, allow me to introduce a principle today that I like to call the affirmation temptation. We all tend to cheat towards the quickest and the most public results. Have you seen this before? People love posting how great they are on social media. They love letting you know how successful they are because it gives an impression or a facade that they are somehow more significant. For example, at work, the metrics might be clear. If I sell more, I get a raise. I get a promotion. Things are going to happen more quickly for me. We have this need-now speed culture that feed our ego and our idealisms. Or at least, you know, letting people know that you're great at work will somehow try to prove that you're healthy in other areas of your life. We all tend to gravitate towards the fastest payoff in a lot of ways if we're honest about humanity. The clearest metrics, the speediest accolades. Which is why a lot of people tend to prioritize their careers, to be honest with you. My story is, is I did that for a good 13 years of my life. Prioritized my career over my marriage, my children, my relationship with the Lord. And it just led to just more depression and defeat, y'all. Honestly, the reason why we do it is sometimes these are just easier metrics to get in our head. Or if you think about parenting, how do you know if you're a good parent? Well, honestly, it could take years. I feel like most of us parents are like, man, I hope it works out. I mean, I'm on year 11, and things got really crazy with the hormones all of a sudden. I don't know what these kids are thinking, doing, or saying. And why did they just scream at me? I said hi. You know what I mean? It could take years to see the fruit of good parenting. Or when it comes to marriage, what are the metrics? Is it how often we snuggle? How many happy feelings we have each week? Or I've seen that many people cheat towards public behaviors, like weight loss or purchasing a new car, having the next new house. But will anyone actually notice my sexual purity? Will anyone notice my self-denial muscle in my life, my disciplines? You see, nobody typically notices the inward progress except God. But is he really watching? That's the question. And I want to say this today, absolutely yes. And that's why it's so critical that I want to help you today. Here's the practical. To regularly set goals in our spiritual lives, our marriages, our parenting, and our physical bodies. Not one at the exception of the others. You heard leaders say it like this. Determine your roles before your goals. And not just your professional life, but all the major area roles in your life. I want to challenge you today. Make a list. I can make a list for you. You probably have eight, ten areas. They're actually your responsibility that you lead in. It's not just your leadership at work. It's your being a good steward with your finances, parenting your children. It's being a leader in the the community at the end. It's being a great spouse. It's being a leader in the church. It's serving in kids' ministry. All these are different roles, titles, if you will, that you possess in your life. Do you have goals in relationship to health for all of the roles? You see, you're not just an employee. You're a Christian. You're a ministry leader. You're a spouse, a parent, a volunteer. So when we set goals, we need to do them in each area. There's my smile for you. Come on, guys. We can do that. And as a Christian, for me, this year, I I just want to read through the Bible every year. It's a simple goal. Do my devotional time every morning, 10 minutes. I do it every day. It's just a goal for my life. uh, As a spouse, I want to go on 30 date nights this year and Doing a marriage enrichment course with my wife and get away with just my wife, not my kids. Because I don't like vacation with my kids. It's not a vacation. That's called family time. It's different. (laughs) Vacation is just me and my wife in Puerto Rico. The kids come along. It's, okay, we're going to deal with that. It's different. You can't. Stop cheating. Stop cheating. Stop doing road trips and say you had intimacy with your wife. You're lying. You all stayed in one hotel room. It didn't happen. You're you're lying. So I want to have date nights. I want to have marriage enrichment time with my wife as a parent. This summer, I want to have two common interests at the end of the summer with my children. 
My son loves to fish, and so we're going to spend time fishing together. My daughter loves cooking and crafts. I love cooking, and so we're going to log hours doing that together, getting into our hobbies. And, and actually, I want to build a healthy discipline in these areas of my life. I want to work with my wife on stewardship of our finances and saving and giving and generosity and the role I have in leadership, the role I have in serving other churches. You see, every category must have a goal. But if you're only setting the goals for your, pro your, your professional life or your personal dreams, your hobbies, take a wild guess what's going to overtake your life. I'm going to tell you it's going to be your job and your hobbies. Those are going to become the priority at the sacrifice of everything else. But here's my greater point. God is looking at our lives from a holistic perspective. He's not going to bless one role in our life at the exclusion of others. He actually wants to bless all the roles. Belshazzar was desperately wanting to overcome these enemies, the Medes and the Persians. But God was wanting Belshazzar to overcome something first. And as we see in Scripture, it's idol worship. You know, the iron and the wood and the gold and the silver? That's not God, by the way. Belshazzar was so focused on his role as king and impressing others. But God wanted him to focus on his role as Yahweh worshiper. You see, all of us have areas in our lives where we just need God's help, and God is calling us towards help. So I don't even need to be prophetic. It's just natural. <laughs> On average, you in this room have an area of your life that you need to grow spiritually. You need to grow in health. If we take a step back and look at our holistic roles and those goals that we set, and we, we infuse, and I want to give you this. This is really the secret here. God's timeline for these goals, not ours. Not our expectations, but God's expectations. We're, gonna, we're just going to learn to actually enjoy the kingdom benefits that God brings. I, I feel like at times God gives people opportunities to experience his provision, and we just don't become good stewards because we don't stay in the discipline of it. So what is it for you today? Is it your spiritual growth? Is it getting into God's word and your prayer life? Is it... For you, do you have adequate fellowship and are you desperate for people to be in your life to get outside your comfort zone? Are you still dating your spouse, y'all? Are you pursuing sexual purity in your life? Are you being intentional enough to transmit your values and your DNA of how much you love the Lord into your kids? We can attend church services all the time and not share it with our children. We can show up at this place and Live out some discipline, but not impart it into the lives of our kids. It's interesting when you study on just child outcomes and them staying connected to the church. Logging hours with the parent at the dinner table, discussing something spiritual once a week, increases the likelihood of your kid loving God for the long haul 400%. Wow. Yet we, we receive and have this personal connection, but we don't impart it into our children. We see in Scripture, this wasn't actually the first time that God appeared and wrote something on stone. We see seven years, 700 years before this moment took place, the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments. It was actually a preventative. We look at the commandments as like some oppressive system of law, but it was actually a proactive, preventative technique to keep yourself in connection with the blessings of God. God wants to bless us. And I, I want to challenge you today. When we see these little convictions in our life and the call to health in these areas of our life as sacred, then I actually believe there's just no end to what God will give you. I, I actually do believe that. I believe that God has blessings financially, in relationship, in your parenting. And he says this, it's not too late. You feel like your time is wasted. You feel like you just haven't done well. It's not too late. God can actually speed up timelines. It was no issue for him to go to Nebuchadnezzar and instantly restore him as king, instantly return all his provision, just because he acknowledged that he was sovereign over the kingdoms of man. Church, you got to hear this today. God has a unique calling on each and every one of your lives. I believe that today. I was sent here from Minnesota to tell you that. God loves you, and he cares for you, and he wants to, he wants to bless you. And I just have this sense. There's areas of your life that have just become dormant. They're not dead, but they feel dead. It's not too late, but they do need some activated step. I actually just sense today that there's 
many of you that have a calling upon your life that simply just needs to get watered by the Holy Spirit. I believe there are some in this room that you're going to be called out to be the greatest missionaries, marketplace leaders, political leaders this nation has ever seen, but it requires a proper alignment and surrender to the Lord. Reminds me of one last story as I think about each of you. There's this, uh, this thing that happened, and anybody ever hear of Death Valley? Back in 2004, let me show you a picture of it. Uh, Death Valley is actually, uh, it's west of Las Vegas. It's one of the hottest places in all of North America. And part of the reason why they, it actually got its name Death Valley is because uh, things die there and it hardly ever rains. Well, back in the winter of 2004, something super rare happened. A, a rare storm came through and dropped over seven inches of rain in a very short period of time. And as that rain fell, there was flash floods, but then all the water just dissipated into the cracks that we see. It all disappeared. Well, all of a sudden in the springtime, you run my surprise. No, all of a sudden in the springtime, we see what is called the super bloom. And because of that water that went down into the cracks, the valley erupted into a giant field of flowers. And everyone in, in the world was kind of caught off guard by this moment. It was like, what happened to the desert? And they called this event the Super Bloom. It's pretty, isn't it? Man, how do we question God's creation? I just don't get it. You see, it wasn't the fact that Death Valley was dead. Rather, it was dormant. The seeds were actually there all along. They just needed rain, you all. And I believe the same is true with you. Today, I actually want to invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to come and maybe water some areas of your life that are so full of purpose and so full of destiny, but they just haven't been surrendered to God. You felt like they're dead. I say they're dormant. Because of the lack of surrender, it's been killing off your purpose. I just feel overwhelmed today that the Lord wants to restore your purpose. He wants to say, I, I'm not finished with you. That dream you had when you were 14, that calling you felt at a young age, what you thought your marriage could be, what type of parent you thought you were going to be? I'm not going to be my mom. I'm not going to be my dad. I'm going to be this. And you slipped away and the disciplines just didn't hold tight. And you just feel like you neglected that area. I want to say the neglected areas of your life are simply dormant seeds. It's not too late. God's not finished with you yet. If there is breath in your lungs, he has purpose for your life. But I do believe it requires an act of surrender. I do believe that God is holy. He requires us to pursue holiness to be with Him. I believe that there's areas of our life with every head bowed and every eye closed in our life that we just haven't made room for God. We've allowed the circumstances and the pursuit of our own career, our own idealism, our own hobbies, our own addictions, our own shame to shut down and dry out areas that we may be watered in previous seasons. If you could stand with me right now. As we finish today, I just believe that God has a little work He wants to do in our lives. I believe in each of our lives, it's just an area, even in my life, there's an area, Lord, I just need to step back into your discipline. And because I'm not living that out, I've actually experienced maybe a dry season, a disappointing season, a discouraging season. For you, maybe it's your marriage today. I have this strong sense of marriage restoration in this house. But if there's an area of your life and you just haven't made room for God in it, and you just feel the compelling, not from my words, but from the Holy Spirit, to submit that to God, to surrender it. Maybe it's your physical health. Maybe it's a secret sin issue. Maybe it's just your marriage or your parenting. And you just want God to show up and meet you where you're at and walk you to a place of provision. I just bold hand up with me. I just, I need God to show up in my marriage. I need him to show up in my physical body. I need to show up in an area of my life I haven't submitted to him. I need him to show up in my parenting. I need to show up. I need, I need, to, I need to submit this to God. And if you can raise that hand with a holy, desperate faith, we serve a God who has provision for you. And here's his provision. It's joy. 
that is unspeakable. It is peace that surpasses all understanding. Who could use more joy? Who could use more peace? Who wants a touch from God? Could we make room for him? I believe that today as we make room for God and we lay down areas that have become false idols in our life or we've, we've abused the, the sacred calling in our life, that God in his sovereignty is going to pour out his provision in this house. He's going to pour out his blessing upon your home. He's going to pour out his blessing upon your parenting and your finances and your physical body that marriages will be restored, that lost sons and daughters will return home, that addiction will fall and freedom will come, and we will experience the goodness of the Lord. We will see his insight. We will see his wisdom. We will see his direction. Come on, make room for God today. It's your beginning. It's your new start. Come on, surrender to him, church. Where I lay down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender I will make room for you Come on, let's make room in our hearts for God today To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Would you make room in your marriage for the Lord today? I will make room Allow the Lord into that struggle. Allow the Lord into that area you haven't released yet. Mom, we surrender, church. prophesy over this room the provision of God would fall in your homes that as you walk out of this place today that you would step out in confidence in direction that God is compelling you to walk in repentance to walk in forgiveness but also receive his goodness his joy and his grace for your marriage can be better your children could love God that you could experience provision that this world can never offer. God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Would you step into the mission of God today? Would you step into your mission as a man of God, as a woman of God, and truly as a child of God? He wants to use you. He loves you. And he wants to pour out his blessing and provision. Do you believe it? And are you hungry for it? Come on, let's go boldly before the throne of grace today.
was that great? Come on, tell Pastor Nate that you love him. That was good. You know, you said something. You said, is God really speaking? And I think we don't want to end uh, our time today. If you're not done, we're not done. And so I I'm just going to do what Anthony's supposed to do. And I'm just going to say, hey, we have some prayer team that would love to. Sometimes we're like, is God speaking? Well, I think you need to go someplace where God often speaks, and that's the prayer corner. If you're not done, you just need to seal something. You just need to tell somebody your story or tell somebody something that somebody else needs to hear. I feel like we just need to open that up for you and just say, uh, we love you, and we just want to make sure that you have the opportunity to go and just seal the deal today. So don't hurry out of that. Look, your friends and your family, they can't leave without you. You've got the keys to the car. So just go and seal something with the Lord if you need to do that this morning. We just want to invite you to do that. And so, Anthony, why don't you take us away? But thank you, Pastor Nate. Come on, give him one more. Come on, Anthony. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Nate and worship team. That was such an awesome service, a word from God for sure. Look, if you're new, we want to get to know you. Head to the lobby there. There's a seven-minute party. We have our volunteer staff that just want to talk to you and want to get to know you, and uh, you can find out a little bit more about Venue Church. And if you've been coming for a while, scan that QR code. This is where you're going to start serving in the kingdom of God. This is where you're going to start serving. We, this is where we want you, and God also wants you. Look, at Venue Church, we give because we love. There is a church in Quebec that is, uh, they are planting a church in the fall and we were able to give eight thousand dollars to ARC Canada and they are planting churches all over Canada and all over the world and that's because of your generosity. I'm gonna sneak in here too because I just wanted to tell you guys how proud I am of you for just opening up your hearts to Compassion Canada last week. You guys sponsored 32 kids here that last Sunday. You saw me, I was a blubbering mess because I saw all those kids on the table that needed help. And I'm just so proud of you guys for stepping up, for having a heart for our world. And we also had some that sponsored kids at the art conference, right, yeah, Anthony? Yeah, that was me, because yeah. we forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some that did online. But you guys, I am just so, so excited for the generous hearts that you have, because I know God's going to pour out into this house so we can be a blessing to those all around the world. Yeah, that's awesome. I sponsored a kid from Bolivia. His name was Jonathan. Yeah, he's pretty cool. I haven't met him yet, but one day. Um, yeah, let me tell you. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of ways you can give after I pray. Father, thank you so much for the generosity of this church, and thank you for the blessing. Father, I thank you that. Uh, we see the call and we're able to fill it, Father, and, and that I pray that you're able to take that seed and you're able to just advance your kingdom, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. There's a ton of ways you can give. You can do e-transfer or through the Church Center app, also debit, credit, or cash at the brick wall. And you know what? Small groups are still happening. We want you to do life with people, and we want you to just scan that QR code and just find a small group for you. This is where life really happens, and I love it. It's the best part of my week. VBS is happening this summer, July 18th, 21st, and July 24th, we're having a wrap up party here. There's gonna be like, how many kids? Like 300 kids, tons of kids. And we need volunteers, we need volunteers. So head to that tiki bar over there, get a drink, and uh, non-alcoholic, I, I guess that was what I did last service. Oh, it's punch, it's a drink from a tiki bar. Anyways, and there is a ton of places to serve. Uh, the, you don't have to just serve this week. We need help cleaning up. We need help uh, watching kids of volunteers like my baby. And there's a ton of places to serve. And uh, we want you to go and get some prayer if this message affected you in any way. So don't leave here without taking that step. At Venue Church, we're here to help people know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. Have a great week.